The next improvement approach is experimental analysis. Sometimes it's called by its more statistical name, design of statistical experiments. And what we see in this approach is a methodology that can become very, very complex. As a matter of fact, there's great debate. Should green belts even learn this methodology? Because there's a lot that it can be done that creates errors in the process. So I, I offer this with a great caution. Planning the experiment is the most important thing. Understanding what's going on. Not doing this by yourself, but talking with someone who's experienced and has done experiments before. I think by the end of this lesson, you'll have a feeling that you don't want to do this alone. So we're going to teach you a very simple approach called a full factorial experiment. Now, what is an experiment? Well, first of all, there are different types of experiments we can do. We begin looking at the world, and we can have a physical model of the world. We can have a logical model, and out of that model, we get our critical factors. Those are the x's. Our y is a function of x. So that's come out of our DMA study. And what we want to do with this physical model is evaluate how those factors can be changed to influence process performance. Do the factors shrink the variation? Do they shift the mean, or do they do both? So the logical model is going to try to understand what are the interrelationships. And so we saw those as interaction effects, two-way factors or three-way interactions or more that will actually have interactions among multiple variables. And so there's three different approaches we can use. One approach to experimentation is called screening. And here what we want to do is get rid of process factors that do not statistically have a strong contribution to the variation process. The second is characterization. Characterization is what we do with a full factorial experiment. And this is used to produce an equation, y is a function of x, with multiple factors that describes the performance envelope within which we'd like to achieve. Optimization is the third type, which is beyond the scope of most green belts. Now, optimization is how do we perform the best or the optimal experimental conditions for operating a particular process. Now, I know having said that, all of you type A engineers out there are going to want to jump right to optimization. But my caution is don't. Because even with an experienced black belt, we go through sequential experimentation to get to that point. And if you have more time to study this, you'll understand the benefit of that. So what is experiment? Well, the challenge is actually design. How do we choose the factors and their levels? So this is really the process starting point. What type of experiment do we have? How are we going to organize the data? How do we control noise in the process? What do we do about noise we can't control? How do we optimize settings of the process factors? So all of those are questions that occur in designed experiments. So the formal definition of a designed experiment is any test for which the inputs are controlled and we plan the analysis. So there's a series of steps. We define the problem. We did that. We establish the objectives. We've done that also in the defined phase. Select the output. We did that in the defined phase. Identify the input factors. Well, that's what measure and analyze were all about. So we begin with choosing factor levels, selecting the experimental design, and then identifying how we're going to structure this. So remember, the purpose of the experiment is to better understand the real world. It's not just about the data. So what we want to do is have a very strong linkage between the design of the experiment and what's actually happening in the real world. Now, good news. There are no new statistics here. The designed experiment is combining four basic statistical methods. Hypothesis testing describes which factors or how we're going to evaluate the variation in the system. Regression analysis is going to be used to calculate the difference between high and low settings of each of those factors. Analysis of variance will be used for the output to describe what is the relative effect of the variation within subgroups and between subgroups. And Pareto analysis will show us the relative magnitude of the effects of change on the process by each of those combinations. We'll give you an example a little later to show you how those work. Now, first, I want to begin by, by dispelling a myth. Many engineers have been taught that the way you do an experiment is you take all of the factors that you have in the process, hold all of them constant except for one, and then change that one, and then see what is the effect on the output. That's called OFAT by statisticians, or one factor analysis at a time. If we do that with two or three, what we start seeing, two or three factors, we start seeing that there are many things that we're missing because we don't see all of the combinations. So the weakness of one factor analysis at a time can be seen in this example. Here we have reaction time. 
and we take a look at what is the best yield for reaction time as a variable. And we see that that's about 74. And we see that that occurs at about 130 or 125, perhaps, degrees of, of uh, minutes of time. What is the best yield in terms of temperature? We see that's at 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, it's Fahrenheit. And that's at 78% yield. So that says we should set this process at 125 minutes reaction time and at 230 degrees. However, if we look at the global process, we see that's only a local optimum. The global optimum occurs someplace else because there's an interaction effect between temperature and time. And as a result of that, the final result from a one-factor analysis at a time does not actually give us the best yield because the best yield is actually 91%. So if we take a look at the process, what we would like to do is not use one-factor analysis at a time. That only gives us a local optimal in the two vectors that we have. What we'd like to do is see how all the combination of factors combine in an experiment. Now, the type of experiment we do is called a cross experiment. This is the full factorial. Cross designs look at all factors at all levels. So if I have four factors, A, B, C, and D, I will take a look at them at the high and low level of the conditions. And so what I can see is the variation within each of those different factors as it is moved, and also then how they have a combination effect on each other. Now, if I take a look at this, we see that we represent such an effect in what's called a DOE hypercube. So DOE stands for Design of Experiments. And what we see is that we have the combinations of these factors, the low and high settings, at each of the corners of this cube. So if it's a two by two, A versus B, it's just a, a two-dimensional cube. However, if we have a three-dimensional cube, we have the hypercube. And the advantage of this is to understand what is the effect in terms of the measure of Y as these variables change from their low and high settings. Now, that means that the, the actual magnitude and measure inside the cube is in the Y measure in terms of the amount of effect of change in the process. Now, we no longer want to deal with dirty data in messy processes like we did in the measure phase. Instead, we want data with integrity in controlled processes. And what that means is we have to deal with the noise that occurs in the experiment. We have to understand how do we manipulate this process so that the noise does not get in our way. And there are a number of things that we can do here. The first is randomization. We want to randomize the order of the experiments. Now this can be very hard for you if you're talking about a physical experiment. Because what happens in the physical experiment, sometimes you say, this doesn't make sense in terms of the way processes are set up. I can't have this setup and then switch to that setup. I should have these sequence of setups because that's the easiest for running the process. But remember, randomization and independence are the two assumptions of all statistical tests. If we don't randomize, what we've done is we created an inherent bias in the experiment. So we need to have random results. One other ingredient in your experimentation process is when you're doing the experiment, make sure that the experiment is done in a random way. Many times people in the work world will try to, if you will, improve your experiment by unrandomizing it because it's easier for them to do. And you'll be able to tell this if you're a black belt looking at this because what you'll have done, you'll have introduced this um, effect where you're going to start seeing the data looking much like it was, and you've eliminated this effect of independence in terms of the selection process. So randomization is the first thing. The second thing we can do is we can block. So if we have a known noise force, uh, source and it's controllable, such as raw material coming from one supplier, or two different shifts doing the same job, what we can do is block and systematically eliminate that effect. In other words, what we'll do is the same experiment within each of those two blocks. So we'll do experiment at supplier one, same experiment at supplier two, and then we can combine and actually determine which of those suppliers is better based on the experiment. Another thing we can do is repeat. And that is, once we've done the experiment, without changing this, we can actually take a look and do the experiment one more time. So we don't change the setups. We do exactly the same thing. What this does is it gives us some idea of short-term variation in the process. How stable is the process? If the process is stable in the short term, that's good. But if it's not stable in the short term, that probably means we don't have all the factors 
properly identified and characterized for the process. Another thing we can do is called replication. Now replication occurs, unlike repeating, it's doing the experiment all over again, but it's at some time late after you've actually taken it down and then done some other experiments and then come back with a different type of setting. This allows us to have an estimate of long-term variation effects. And what we can start seeing here is, is there variation due to setup or to changeover or to different types of conditions? So we'll see here how rational subgroups can influence the performance of the process. Well, what happens if we can't control the variation? Well, what we see if we can't control the variation, it may be influenced by things like environmental effects. And what environmental effects are doing is it's actually attacking the outside of this hypercube, and it's going to cause it to collapse or expand based on the impact of that type of uh, factor. So what we see is we actually do a very different type of experiment there. No longer a full factorial, we do what's called a Taguchi design. And we're going to take a look at the signal, what's inside the box, versus the noise, the effect outside the box. Now, Taguchi designed experiments are at a black belt level. So we don't really have time to talk about them here. But what I want to do is just give you the, the idea that there are many additional tools and many additional methods which we can't actually go into now that will give you an ability to see processes much more clearly and understand effects much more than just the full factorial design we're going to talk about. So what do we do? Well, we see a standard experiment starts by looking at how many factors are there. If there's one, we can do one factor analysis and, and be very careful with that. If we have two factors, then we have this problem of how do we get this under, unseen state or where both of them are moving at once. And so we can do what's called a two-level factorial design. Are the factors quantitative? Yes or no? If no, we can do what's called a general factorial design. You'll see that in Minitab when we go to our session. Or if they are quantified, we can have a process variable which we get a response surface, or we have a mixture design, as in chemicals or cooking or in pharmaceuticals. And that's a, a mixture design where we're looking at combinations of ingredients and process variables. So what we're going to do is we're going to be taking a look at a very simple two-level factorial design. That's called the full factorial design. Now, we are deliberately going to change the levels. And we're going to change the pattern in a way that we can analyze the effectiveness and efficiency of the process. So what's the objective of the experiment? How much will it cost in terms of time? Will we lose productivity in the process? Now, how are we going to randomize the process? Who are we going to get involved in this? Uh, how long will this take? These are all practical planning questions we need to think about. Most experiments go wrong not because of the statistical analysis, but they go wrong because we didn't plan the experiment right in the first place. This is why I hesitate to give even the full factorial design as a green belt experiment. Because this experiment is something that will actually set your management's understanding of the value of experimentation. So my caution is, as you start getting into this, be sure you talk with someone who's done this before. Preferably a black belt who's done this or a master black belt. Or maybe your company has a full-time statistician who can help you with this. So we understand the current process. That's the beginning. So we build our process knowledge through exploratory data analysis, define, measure, analyze. So just like we talked about in terms of the Kaizen Blitz, after the analyze phase, we're in a perfect place to actually do the experiment. When we take a look at these, we select the experiment factors. This comes out of our selection process in terms of define, measure, analyze. We've identified those X's that actually make a difference in process performance. So again, DMA is a good starting point for going into this. Now, the first thing we do in the actual experimentation process is we choose the factor levels. And what I want to recommend to you is to choose bold levels. So we're going to choose a low and a high level for the process. And a bold level means that if I choose a low and a high very big, then if that process, as it moves from low to high, has no impact on the Y, that factor is not significant. So this allows us to eliminate those factors. And it also allows us to see what is the impact of variation on the process. So we'd like to go maybe 20% above or below specifications. If we don't have specifications, maybe set this at our 95% confidence interval. So what we see is we're going to move and control average performance of these processes. 
And what we want to do is find the uh, factors, the f or the combination f of x, for each of those x's that's going to actually give us a change in the process performance. Shifting the variation uh, in terms of reducing it or increasing it, whichever we need to do, and then moving the average or the location of the process. Now, the outputs we get, we're going to have three different types of outputs. So we'll see, first of all, interaction plots. And here we see if we have parallel lines, there's no interaction. However, if you see in the upper right, there is a combination of two lines coming together at one of the settings. That is a strong interaction effect. And we see that that is something that might make a difference in our main effects. We take a look at the main effects plot, and here we're seeing how does the average change as we go from one factor to another, from the high to low. And here, if we have an angle, so we have slope in the line, that means there's a change. If there's no angle, it says there is no change as we went from one to the other. And the magnitude of this change we call the effect. Now, one other thing that we will get out of Minitab is we will get a Pareto plot. And this is a plot of the size of that effect of change that we saw in the main effects for also main effects in all the interaction effects in the process. And when they exceed this dashed line that we see on the Pareto plot, what that is saying is those effects are statistically significant. So in the Pareto plot on the left, we see the top three, A, D, and A, D, interaction effect, are all significantly above the dashed line. So what I want to do is then shift this description so it's clearer for management. So if I go and I right click twice on those bar charts, what I can do is I can edit them and I can put pattern and color. And now what I've done is I've, I've, I've done this editing, I've taken away some of the values and so I don't know, no longer say what the response is. It's just Pareto chart of complaints. And I've now created a chart that's more amenable for presentation to management. So that gives you a brief description of the process of design of experiments. And what we're going to do is we're going to have two more modules now where we go into Minitab. The first module in Minitab will talk about the analysis or how do we actually set up this experiment and how do we, we uh, define the conditions that will allow us to have a randomized experiment created. The second Minitab uh, module will tell us how to analyze that experiment and how to create the output for us to present to management.